Good morning. Top of the morning to you all. Is top of the morning to you all. Good morning. Now we'll try it again. Top of the morning to you all. Is great. It's it's good to be back. <laughs> it's good to be back uh, together with you all and to worship together. And uh, we want to spend this time, this hour, whatever we have this morning. We want to uh, together worship and uh, praise the Lord. And we want to simply ask God to give us grace to worship and uh, that our hearts would be lifted for sure. I remember in uh, in uh, school, I remember something that a sage of old uh, had written and said, and, uh, and his conclusion was that God was the God of chaos. He liked chaos. He was enamored with chaos because he loved to, he loved to fix things. Well, I'm not sure that God, our God is a God of chaos. Uh, he does fix things. We are living in a world that is very chaotic, isn't it? And, uh, and the Lord is fixing to come and fix it all again. He will fix it. But whether I would call him the God that loves chaos, I'm not sure I would go to that place. But this morning, we are going to get together. We are going to sing and praise and, and uh, worship the Lord because God is a God that loves us and fixes things as we run into him and they find we find that the wheels have come off. God is a God that fixes things. Uh, the call to worship, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes his boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let's do that this morning. But before we go there, would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are God Almighty. And Father, you have called us not because we were mighty. You've called us not because we were a lot. A lot of people you have called us because you've loved us. And you love us still. And Father, we thank you that you have, that you have prepared a salvation for us that is for eternity. And Father, this morning we want to stop and say thank you for that salvation that you have provided for us through faith. And, and Father, Father, this morning as we worship, we have come together to worship you. And Lord, we ask that you would give us the grace to worship. And Father, give us also the mind to worship you. And we pray for Mark as he ministers to us. We pray for Daryl as he leads us in singing. And Father, may your name be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Daryl, I think it is your turn then. Good morning, everyone. I would encourage you to take your hymn books to half and turn to number 14 and stand as we sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Yeah. 
Christ alone.
me to John chapter 3, starting at verse 22, and we'll go up to the end of the chapter, I think is what? Just go to 30. Just 30. Alrighty then, if I, for, if I keep going then... No problem. No problem, okay. <laughs> uh, John the Baptist's testimony about uh, Jesus. Verse 22, would you read with me? Then after this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing at uh, Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. This was before John was put into prison. And, and an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. And to this John replied, A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom, and the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. So far, the reading of God's word. Mark, would you come and minister to us, and the Lord bless you. Just seeing if Dave left anything cool behind there. Children's Church. They know they're gone. They don't forget. All right, I'm going to pick up a thought that uh, Dennis left in here earlier, if he would allow me. And if not, it's probably going to happen anyway, so I don't really know why I ask. Oh, just to be nice, I guess. We got a good friendship that way. It'll be, work out just fine. Uh, he had a friend there who was uh, thought maybe God enjoyed a bit of chaos or ever how that worked there. And I'm, I'm, he might be a great friend of yours. You might be that friend. I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes people have a friend, but we'll see how that goes. But probably didn't work too well with the first chapter of the Bible. I'm thinking about that. The fact that God likes fixing things and that God isn't a big fan of chaos actually works really well with the thought of preaching. And I'll just take a small detour to get there, so bear with me. But as you noticed already, we chopped it down from verse 36 to verse 30. So those of you who already have one hand on a dinner fork ready to go, you're celebrating in your hearts. You don't have to stick your hand up. You know who you are. You're the ones who had a half cookie for breakfast, and now that metabolism is just roaring. <laughs> yes, that's true. But anyways, first bit of the Bible, Genesis 1, and this isn't part of the message, so it's just a little preamble. There's already chaos. Earth was formed in void, and what does God do? Well, he takes that chaos, and he forms something good. He forms something peaceful. He fixes it. Right, God's a God who fixes things. And even if you go from that point in the Bible and you go extrapolate across the rest and you see, oh, what, what's something God left behind for us that's so articulately crafted, so non-chaotic, so peaceful. You have scripture formed in, for by God directed through man, or yes, he directed through man, to be, to be a peak into a ministry to us. So we take that very non-chaotic, a very peaceful thing, and we get the blessing of the scripture. And so when you come up here and 
and you preach or anyone comes up in the preaching ministry, they are standing behind the very organized, peaceful message of God. And a part of preaching is standing behind the scripture, right? A lot of people have things they want to say. And sometimes you hear, particularly in Bible school, when it gets, say, 11, 11.30 at night, you've had pizza, two Coca-Colas, maybe some licorice or whatever you had there, and you sit there and you discuss, how are we going to fix the church? Right? And we got lots of great ideas. And sure enough, one of these ideas is always going to be, well, I'm going to preach a sermon on this. Right? Uh, they did something bad, or, they, or we, we need whatever. We need to do this or that. And you kind of go, okay, that's not a bad idea. But what you should be preaching on is, I want to preach firmly from Scripture. I want, to, I want to stand behind Scripture. I want to bring that forth to the people, right? It's not, what ideas do I have for the church? It's when you dive into Scripture. What comes out at you that the Lord says, this is what I have for the people, right? It's not an idea you bring there, so... And that's always a goal of mine when I come up here, is not to have an idea and find scripture behind it. I want to go to the scripture and pray and, and hope because you know what? I'm a, I'm a fallen person. Things can slip in there, but you hope that as you present the scripture and, and I try even through through style to go try, try to stand verse by verse and go this is what the scripture is saying and this is and this is what it has for us. And so as you see me go through, I, I, I often go verse by verse, or even go a little bit larger than that, that the goal is really to stand behind the scripture and say, here is scripture. Here is in my ideas. This is for you. This is the ministry of, of the word. That's why I said, that's why it's so, it's, it's the ministry of the word. So that's, uh, uh, just a little bit of that. I've been trying to think of, like, what is preaching and how does that work, and what, what's, what's the ministry that I call to it? These ideas, they're, they're not well formed here. It's, it's a little bit off the cuff, so please bear with me that way. But, but it's always, always the goal, and even one thought I was having last night was even the way a preacher comes up and preaches a sermon, the way he treats Scripture, whether he says it specifically or just through, through his example, he shows you this is how you handle the Bible, right? When he, if a preacher comes forward and says, here's an idea and I'm going to make the Bible fit my idea, that's wrong. When a preacher goes forward and says, here's the Bible and here's the ideas that comes to you, then he, through his ministry, is helping everyone. It, through an example, saying, this is how we submit ourselves to Scripture, not how we use some Scripture to submit to us. So that's uh, something that's been working on in in my head. But with with all of that said, I'll open the word of prayer and we'll dive into John chapter 3. So thank you for your word. Thank you. Thank you that you have things to say for us and you've and that your word has been ministering to, to people for thousands of years and Lord that that it will keep ministering to people until you come back and, and maybe even longer. Lord, I pray that, that that would be a blessing that you would bring upon us today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. No. I chose John chapter 3, verse 22, because last time I was up here, I stopped at verse 21, and I've been slowly doing a series through John, but unfortunately, there's been some in McCurry, some here. I think that's it. I think this is the place I preached. So it's... I like to say it's a series for you guys, but really it's, it's a place I can go to, to next. But at this current rate, in 16 years, I'm going to be done. So, And I hope you're all here for it, but I mean, the odds are not. Well, we know. We know. That's just how things work out. But John 3, 322. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained with, there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem, because water was plentiful there, and the people were coming and being baptized. For John had not yet been put into prison. 
So verse 22 says, after this. So what is after this? The first half of chapter 3, Jesus is in Jerusalem, and he's been having a, a conversation with Nicodemus that night. So he comes from this urban setting of a, a personal ministry, and he's coming out into the Judean countryside performing a, more of a baptism ministry. And it's, and it's also mentioned that John is also in the countryside. And the location he is, there actually is some debate of where that exactly is. No one's exactly sure. But you know what? There was water and there was people. So when you're John the Baptist, what do you do? Well, it's pretty obvious. But, but we have these, these two groups. Jesus, his disciples, and John and his disciples in his ministry. They're out there, and it specifies it's been before John was put in the prison. Why would that be added in there? Well, now we get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all together, one after the other. But early on, John would have been the last gospel written, and so we look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Everyone knows, like, John doesn't got a lot more left in his life, right? He's... It's about to, to go down, and so people might look at this going, okay, shouldn't he be gone by now? But no, he specified, no, John is still active in his ministry. There is, there is overlap. And in, in John, okay, I'm going to try to try to clarify here. We always have the same problem when we preach out of the gospel according to John, and we preach about John the Baptist. You get the John and John thing going on, so I'm going to try my best to keep that straight for everybody. That the, the, the author, John, already, is, already has brought forward the, the story. John the Baptist's contribution, as would normally be seen in most of the other Gospels, has already been completed. But we're coming back, we're coming back, back around to, to, for a further contribution to the Gospel. And we, and we see that John's always providing testimony about Jesus. He's, it's part of his ministry. He's preparing the way. And it's, a, and it's an important ministry. Every single gospel mentions it. Right? And why is some of it important? Well, we'll go through the, we'll go through the message. But a couple things are, he was a reliable witness. Many considered him to be a prophet, even though he did not claim to be. He had such character and such competence and such consistency that people found it to be very reliable and you know you know what they say about people's lives and people's ministry and they say well well how'd they finish well John John the Baptist ministry was already finished they knew how his character was all the way till the end right so when you have a, a reliable witness whose testimony cannot change who is well renowned like that's something that's a great starting point so that was part of why, why he was in, in there. And then we'll continue on the passage as we understand more. Oh, wait, sorry. By going on the passage, we're going to go to chapter 1 and see what John was saying about Jesus. Because this is the context for which this passage is in. Uh, verse 6 goes, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Right. And John clarifies these statements further on when he, or John the Baptist is quoted saying that John the Baptist is not the Christ. Christ. That John baptizes with water, but Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. That Jesus is the very Son of God. What John says about himself is that John the Baptist, he, is, he says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And when he talks about Jesus, he says, after me comes a man who ranks before me, for he was before me. Yeah. John's ministry and his message was active before Jesus, Jesus came onto the public scene. And there was a bit of overlap, and so we're seeing that overlap right now. And we're seeing the two pitted against each other just a little bit. Verse 25 of John chapter 3. 
I hear the flipping, so I'll let you guys get back there. I don't want to leave anyone behind, at least not on purpose. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. The John's disciples got into a discussion and it just says, with a Jew, it just says, over purification. The scripture does not clearly state if it was purification through a baptism or purification through cleanliness of their di dinnerware or how it goes. The scripture is, is intentionally unclear on that, and I'm going to to do my best to, to leave it there. But what scripture did do was leave it in the context of the two baptism ministries. So clearly, this conversation about, about purity, about purification, brought forward the idea of Jesus' baptismal ministry. However it came, and whether it was a who this, this specific Jew was, obviously he was someone acquainted with purification in the ministries as well. And so John's disciples came to him with this report. And based off of what we know from chapter 1, we think, hey, great report, right? That, that there's all these people going to Jesus. But that's not the context in which it says here. I point, I point towards the, the detail that says all are going to him. Well, what do we know from the verses right now? Well, that's just not true, right? What was the ministry of John? There was, they went to baptize near water where people are. So clearly not all people are going to Jesus. The jealousy there, you can, you can see it a little bit, right? The, we, we like to make, sometimes... We like to make statements, sometimes out of our jealousy, sometimes out of, out of whatever. They're, they're over the top. It's like, oh, look, all are going to him. You know, minus these people. But that doesn't make the point. All are going to him. Or if you're ever at youth group, it's like, and you play Dutch Blitz, and they go, oh, we got our bus kicked. No feet connected with any posterior, but, you know, like it's a... Try to clean up the language, right? There's kids around. But anyways, the, uh, <laughs> but we overstate these things to make a point, and I believe that's what's happening here. Is there's this rivalry, there's this pitting. They're 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 on the same team, but they don't view it that way, right? It's sometimes you look at the success of others and you go, man, why don't we have that? Aren't we also good? They weren't. They weren't good teammates, as it were. Right? If you think of a, a place this often comes up is different sports teams. Right? Everyone wants everyone on their team to do really well, and they all want to win together. But you know when you really want to win? When you're the guy who scored the winning touchdown, scored the winning goal. Right? I'm mostly a sports guy. I don't... I don't necessarily know, even though my wife's a piano teacher, teacher, I don't know how the musical achievement things works. But right, you, sometimes you get that rivalry, even though you're all going towards the same purpose. Yeah, you want to be the star. That's just, it's inner human sin, really. And John hears this and he responds to this. As it says in verse 27, John answered, A person cannot receive one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. John's ministry, the very thing he was known for, who was he? He's John the Baptist, right? That's who he was. That's what he was known for was a very gift given from heaven. It was something not by the power of man. It wasn't that John was so exceptional that they all wanted to follow him and chase him. That was not the power of his ministry. It was a gift from heaven. So the increase of Jesus' ministry and the decrease of John's ministry, at least in prominence, that itself was a gift of God. So he... So that's why I think there was more conflict amongst the disciples there, because so, there was the need to clarify that, no, these are things from heaven. These are not things from man. And he says, you yourself bear me witness. 
John's, John's followers needed reminders of the very purpose of John's ministry. In John 1.31, he states, I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And now he's revealed to Israel and the, his disciples are worried, hey look, everybody's going to him. This should be good. <laughs> Right? His, his followers called him called him rabbi. They should have been on top of these things. But John's a man of patience. He takes the time to explain to him. You don't see him tearing a strip off on the right away. He's trying to lead them to where they should go. Because part of his ministry is also for his disciples to go and follow Jesus. In fact, that's the foundation of his ministry. When, when Jesus comes to John in chapter 1, and we see the interaction, what does John say? He says, Behold the, la the, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He also says about Jesus, that Jesus comes and baptizes with the Holy Spirit, that Jesus is the very Son of God. This is the context that these questions are. These are the things that aren't just preached about a little bit. These are preached about regularly. These were one-off comments. <laughs> These were almost the very summary of the whole ministry. And John continues to explain to his, to his disciples in chapter 29, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. So he gives them a bit of a... It's, it's an image. It's an example. We're, and in this example, I guess just for clarity, I, I know most of you probably track along, but I remember as a kid seeing the word bridegroom and going, well, I don't ever want to be that, right? Because, you know, the word bride's in there, so you kind of go, uh. But no, in this... Uh, the, the, the over here, they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Right. The uh, the bridegroom that's that's what we would call the groom. <laughs> He's the groom for the bride. So the bridegroom. Sometimes English is just that simple. Sometimes it's not. Right. And the friend of the bridegroom, that is John. The bridegroom is Jesus. The friend of the bridegroom is John. Right. And this, and you see, it's not just a friend of the bridegroom. It's the friend of the bridegroom. Luckily, it's easy to bridge the context here a little bit because we have something in our, in our marriage tradition called a best man. And that would be very similar. There's a couple differences we'll touch on. But John is basically the best man. And what did the best man do at that time, the friend of the bridegroom? Well, he would help facilitate the wedding. He'd help get things going, make sure the groom got there. There's... There's some debate as to his, ex his exact role, but at the bare minimum, he was a facilitator of getting the bride and the groom together and gone. Like that's, and not dissimilar to a modern day best man. I've been lucky enough to be in, in a few wedding parties, but I've been, the, I've been the best man twice. And it's different when you're just a friend of the groom or the friend of the group, right? There's a message. You feel there's a bit of an extra obligation if you're doing the job right. Some of you are probably thinking back to your best man going, Ugh, man, he should have taken a page from this book. Like, that's not what they were doing at all. But, uh, but a good best man encourages the groom, gets the groom there. If it, you know, When the groom freaks out, can't figure out how to tie his tie that morning, if you're over 25 and, and the best man, you go and tie the tie. If not, you go find your dad to go tie, tie the tie of the guy, right? Like you're, if his car breaks down, who's going to pick him up? The best man's going to go out there. If he has to carry, right, that's the role of the best man. And, and even, even, let's keep bridging the, the context a little bit. In the modern day, a best man's often known to have his, his speech. And you're probably thinking when you think, oh, my best man really screwed it up. That's probably where he screwed it up was at the speech there. But... But again, this this idea of this wedding, and anyone who's been a part of a wedding knows there's something, okay, you won't know this phrase, but what I call it, the wedding tornado, right? Because things are going on all around, 
Brian and the groomer are in the middle of it. You're trying to keep it calm in there, but then as things go around, that tornado's got to sort everything together and get you going in the right direction. Tornadoes are more destructive, but that's how it feels kind of when you're in it. It's like, man, everything's going. But in the end, the tornado doesn't destroy everything. It sorts itself out. And so when you get to that point, like it says here, right? Right? When, when he stands and hears him, hears the bridegroom and says, okay, the groom's here. We're ready to go. My speech is in my pocket. The food's there. The cars are there. We're all, we're all good to go. Right? Most of your work is done. And that's what John says. He says, therefore, this joy of mine is complete. He's, he's got him there. He's, his role was to get the bride, the people of, of, of God, to Jesus, the groom. And he has done 90% of the work, right? The joy is coming. He can enjoy the wedding. He can enjoy them coming together. And it's not just a great image because it fits well in our context. Throughout Scripture, there's the idea of God marrying his people. Through the Old Testament, you would see, yes, God and Israel and marriage, and there's lots of language involved with that. We're not going to dive too deeply into that, but even as we go from this point into Scripture further, I'm just going to read one verse, John 19.7. I'm not John. Written by John, Revelation 19.7. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready. Right? That's a continuation of the thought. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who John points and says, I'm, I'm the friend of the bridegroom, that's the groom, right? He's the Lamb, you're the bride. Let's, let's make this happen, right? Like, it's, that's the whole thing. It's, it's a clear image. You can see this is what he needs to do. This is what he was doing. Not only that, it also states that Jesus is God. Right? It's not just something for them to understand. It's re reinforcing. He's not just any old groom. Right? He's the, the groom, which actually fits well enough into the other series of messages going on by Dave. So hey, that, that works out well, too. So now that... Now that he hears the groom's voice and things are happening, what's, what's left for the friend of the bridegroom? John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. John needs to complete his mission, right? Complete his ministry given to him from God. And it's not that he stops doing anything altogether, because... I mean, if you think about it, there's still a little bit of work to be done, but he must decrease right at the wedding. If you remember the, the, the best man too much, maybe there was a problem there, right? Like you, you step back, you point towards the groom, you, you minister to the groom, you bless the groom. That's, that's the rule. Now, now the preparation has come. He must increase. Jesus must increase. John must decrease. So I'll go back to because one of the beginning thoughts is why is John one of the witnesses called upon in every gospel? Right? You go to the gospel according to Mark. What's the first thing you read about? John talking about Jesus, right? You go to you go to Luke, you go to Matthew. Early on, prominent John's witness about Jesus. Why is it in every gospel? Well, it's a little self-evident. That was the ministry God had for John. It wasn't because of John. It's because God said, this is your job, and I want you to do it. Right? And also it's because, by the graciousness of God, John completed that ministry. Right? Through his life, through his service, through his actions, he pointed and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Right? He's the kind of, kind of follower of Jesus that is a great example of maturity and humility and obedience to God. And I definitely think a major part of why he mentioned all these Gospels is because God exalts the humble. He had every opportunity here, and it was encouraged even by his followers to you know, take more credit. Right? 
lift his own name up and he goes, no, this is my time to decrease. The Lord has lifted me up to a position and now, now he's calling me to step down, right? That God is blessing John's humility. And it's definitely valuable to be inspired and convicted by John's life. And I think it, this passage, it brings a few questions to mind for me. Right, if we are especially thinking of John's life and ministry, it's like, are, are you a mature believer of Christ? And if you are, are you an example to those younger in the faith? Do you help those who bring forward silly things or even just things that are immature, right? John had immature followers, right? Do you help them out? Or do you, or do you just correct and condemn them? Do you go, no, you're wrong, right? No, that's not the way, that's not the way to do it. Do you actually go and help them or do you just bring the hammer down on them, right? John, John brought patience. Right? He, brought, he brought love to those who were in the ministry with him who needed help. Right? I think that's something we definitely can follow. And I also look at the example of, of John's disciples. Is Do we get distracted by the fights? Right? Do we insist on our own way in ministry? Because right? Right? it's not like their ministry was bad. They had a good ministry. Right? But when confronted with another ministry, they said, oh, we, they, oh, look, they're all going to them. Like, that's not good. Right? They would prefer their own way. Right? They got distracted by the fights. Like, oh, this is the way we have to do ministry. This is the way we, we've always done. This is the way we have to sing our songs. This is the way we have to do our service. This is the way we have to baptize. They got so distracted by the way it was always done, and they were asking the wrong question. Right? The question was not how is God blessed in the past, is what does God want me to do now? Right? Even with a, a sermon, it's not what, what was a good sermon last month. You go to scripture and you ask the Lord, what's a good sermon for tomorrow? Because I don't know tomorrow, only God knows tomorrow, right? That's the only person. So are we going to be divided by our ministries? And I emphasize we're our ministries. Or are we going to be united by God's ministry? Are we going to, to ask the question, what, is, what would God have us do? And maybe seek together, as opposed to going, well, they're different than me, and they're different than me, so we're just going to stay apart. We're both doing good things. Yeah, you know what? There's a lot of good things out there. But if you do the good thing the wrong way, it's a whole lot of useless. Right? It's a whole lot of useless. Right? And the third question is, do we make excuses to avoid what God would call us to? Right? Do, we, do we say, well, you know what? I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm a preacher. I'm whatever, an office worker, uh, a nurse, a construction worker, whatever. And you go, I'm that. I'm quiet. I'm loud. I can't preach. Right? Or... I can't let that go, right? I have to say something, right? Do you make excuses to get away with what God would have you do? Because it's not what you are or what you're doing. It's what God would have you do next, right? Because John was confronted there. What was he going to do? He was John the Baptist, right? Like... And he's like, you know what? I'm not going to be the Baptist anymore, right? Jesus is going to be, and his fault, it really was his fault, Jesus follows doing the baptisms. But Jesus is going to increase, and he was going to decrease. He laid down the thing that defined him, right? And to the point that, ended up that his life was taken, right? He laid down everything, and he didn't make an excuse. What was his response to that? He was overjoyed. He was extremely joyful. He's like, you know what? The way we have been doing things was great. It's a great ministry, but the Lord called him to something next. And don't, and don't hear me say that I think everything has to change. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is, if there's going to be a change, let's look to God for the change. And if we're going to stay the same, let's look to God to stay the same. Right? I heard of a story of a man in ministry who he, uh, 
he felt like, man, everything's pushing for me to leave. And he's like, you know what? They all want me gone. I'm just going to go. Right? And then to this day, he looks back and he's like, you know what? That was the wrong thing to do. It wasn't that he was being treated well in Shazay, but he, he said, I should have waited until I knew God wanted me to leave. Right? He figured he wanted to leave. They wanted him to leave. He was going to leave that camp ministry. But that was the, that's the wrong question. Right? What does God want me to do left? Look. Right? Gotta think it takes it takes strong character both to leave and to stay, right? It, and John was a man of a strong character because he knew what God had for him. If God had him to leave, he was to leave. If God had him to stay, he used to stay. And that's that's what we would have for us, but it was all all for the ministry God had for him. Right. As John said, he must increase, or, and I, but I must decrease. And it was all, all for the purpose of God's glory. And there was a quote by, by Albert Barnes I thought really fit this, this well. So if I wasn't able to articulate some things, hopefully this, this can. And the quote goes, No work is so honorable and joyful as the ministry of the gospel. None are so highly honored as those who are permitted to stand near the Son of God, leading perishing men to the cross. Now I'm going to read it one more time. No work is so honorable and joyful as the ministry of the gospel. None are so highly honored as those who are permitted to stand near the Son of God, leading perishing men to the cross. It's about his ministry. It's about pointing to the cross. May we all do that in our, in our lives, in our ministries, and I pray that be on all of our hearts as I hope the Lord puts it on mine. For closing uh, him, let us turn to number 103 and stand if you are able. Uh, hallelujah, what a savior. Spirit, you may have found it.